while you folks are enjoying, some of you are already through, some of you are still eating, don't let us interfere with your eating, but I'm going to go ahead and start telling you the story of all of this because um, I'm trying to pack about 60 years or more into about a half an hour or so. So by starting early, by starting early, I can sort of get you going. So what is this picture? You guys have guessed, said it's not Jacob's Aquatic Center. It's not, I asked somebody, I said, so the big question is, does the guy riding have pants on? And the answer to that is yes, he does. Um, <laughs> Island Community Church, believe it or not, started as a youth group. Ranch, this was called Youth Ranch, and Youth Ranch was primarily a group that, um, if you guys have just recently seen the Jesus Revolution a movie, uh, I told Colleen, we don't need to go see it because we sort of lived through it. Uh, but on the West Coast, all that was going on was also happening on the East Coast, and Florida Bible College was a big part of that. Uh, they, they originally met on uh, Brickell Avenue, US 1 in Miami, and then eventually moved up to Hollywood, and after that moved to Orlando, and, and now I think they're all completely online. So Youth Ranch was started all over Florida, and they would have these massive youth camps. This, believe it or not, was taken from a 35 millimeter slide, and when I pulled it up on the computer, that's how it turned out. It looks like a paint by numbers deal. But um, this was actually, one of the youth can, one of the youth deals that they would do in the summer at Florida Bible College. So this apparently is some kind of a uh, a resort that they had. Well, Florida Bible was actually an old Hollywood Beach hotel was where they they met, and so that's what this is. And I show this because Island Community Church would have started because of the root of guys that were coming down here. Uh, Bill Vestal and uh, a whole mess of other guys that names that don't mean anything except that probably Wayne and Tina in here right now that would know those names. But that's how we got started. So next picture is a picture of this guy was my quarterback in high school. I was a receiver, linebacker. This guy was a Christian who drove me crazy. <laughs> Because all he wanted to do was tell, talk to me about Jesus, and that was the last thing I wanted to hear. And this guy is the first pastor, eventually, of Island Community Church. His name is Bruce Porter. You say, wait, I've heard that name before. Is that any relation to Wayne? Yes, that's Wayne's brother. And uh, so that's how Wayne ended up down here. He was at Florida Bible College. Wayne would come down. I asked him when he started. He started coming down in 1973. And I'll tell more about that story in, in just a minute. But he was working as a, a volunteer, helping with a bus route. But Bruce and Dale begin to have a vision for a church for adults here in Island Community or in the Keys back in the mid 60s. So Island Community Church was founded in 1968. So this picture is taken right around that time. Bruce was a registrar at Florida Bible College. A couple that attended another church down here were not happy with the denominational ties and the lack of gospel. And they were very involved and very familiar with Florida Bible College and they wanted to start a church. So they opened their home, which is if you, as you pull out the main drive, if you look just to the right, You'll see a building that's fenced in. If those of you who were down here during Irma, you remember the big sailboat that washed up in the yard. That was where Island Community Church started, in the home of Floyd and Melissa Russell, which is why this building was called the Russell Educational Building some years ago. This is the home. You can still see the, the uh, brickwork. is just like that as it was. After Floyd and Melissa sold it, it changed hands multiple times. It became a, a major home involved in a drug bust uh, back in the era when we were doing all the, all the uh, drug running down here in the Florida Keys. And somebody called and said, hey, would you guys like to take that and make a, like a, a home for, we know you have an interest in, in a home for like troubled girls or teens and et cetera, et cetera. And you would not have believed the not in my backyard kickback we got over that. But so it never, it never happened. So, but that's, that's where it started. 
And that's uh, Mr. Russell, Mrs. Russell, and Elena Jimenez. And I think that's JC, I'm not sure, standing over there. Bruce, before he lived here in the Keys, would fly from Hollywood, where he was teaching, where he was a registrar of the college. He would fly down every weekend, and he would land. How many of you knew there was an airport in Port Largo? Yeah. Now, a few of you knew about it. He would land there. He took Colleen and I on a trip one time, and we took off from, from Port Largo, and it was like taking off of an aircraft carrier. The plane dipped down and almost skimmed the water until it finally lifted up and we got, got away. And then when we landed, we ended up landing in an orange grove up in the central part of the state. Colleen said, never will I do that again. <laughs> so, uh, and where he would land in Tabanero one or the other. But Bruce would do that, fly down here and preach on weekends and then fly back home to be ready to be there Monday morning to teach. And that's a picture of Bruce very early on here at Island Community. <clears throat> Elena and Humberto Jimenez, those of you knew Bert, these are his parents. And uh, Bert and Elena, Elena was a teacher, incredible, gifted lady, had her PhD from Cuba. They wouldn't recognize her in the United States. She had to go back to school to finish her degree and to be able to uh, teach at uh, Plantation Key Elementary. She started a, a daycare center at a, at a church down here and then kept bending our ear about a need for daycare centers and schools. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But he was one of the first trustees of Island Community Church. If you look at our original documents uh, back in 1968, his signature along with Bruce's and Dale's are on almost everything. So that's Floyd and Melissa and Miss Elena standing out in front of Miss Elena's house. Island Community Church number two. So if you look at our auditorium right now down the street and you look out and you'll see that mortgage business across the street that used to be the old U.S. Post Office for Isla Morana, and uh, it was owned by Floyd Russell's stepmother, who rented it to Island Community Church, and so we were there for several years. I just want you to notice, you can see the Children's Center, that thank you, Elena, for encouraging that, and our first teacher was a lady named Connie Lindquist, who ran that along with, I believe, Ruby, uh, Linda Daly and Ruby Pierce, if I remember correctly. So these buses that will play a key role here in a little while. This is a picture of one of our youth activities. Um, looks like it might even be, they're eating watermelon. I think it's over at actually, uh, <clears throat> probably in Floyd's where he lived on the ocean side. But the girl standing right here is a girl named Linda Lang. Oh, and the reason really? Linda is so important is that, as I told you, I was, pretty opposed to anything that related to the gospel, as most of you know, but Linda came into our home because her mother had died and her dad, her stepdad, had been arrested and she needed a home. So Colleen and I made a home for her, became her legal guardians. We didn't realize at the time, I didn't realize at the time, uh, because it would have been a deal breaker, that she was a committed Christian. And uh, her testimony, along with a bunch of the kids that were in my marine biology class at Coral Shore, and biology classes at Coral Shore, were very involved in the youth group, and they began to just peck away at me. And so that's, that's exactly, I, I point to that little girl, I tell you, that girl is responsible for Colleen coming to Christ for sure, because I volunteered to go help at a, a camp, one of those Florida Bible College camps, without telling Colleen where we were going. <laughs> because she was a very good Catholic girl. And uh, on a Wednesday night, we were laying in bed and she began to cry. She said, I'm really confused. I don't know whether mm -hmm. what they're saying about Jesus is true or not. And I said, well, let's go see if Bruce is still downstairs because he was still working at the college. We went downstairs and he reached back when he saw us coming and took down a Bible and showed her, first of all, that it was approved by the Pope. So it was a Vulgate Bible, so she knew it was okay to look at. So he said, Colleen, did you know that the Bible says you can know for sure that heaven is your home? And she said, it does not. <laughs> the pastor would have told me that, or the priest would have told me that. So he showed her 1 John 5, 13. These things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. And that was the beginning of her spiritual journey. I've never seen anybody, I sort of tiptoed in, 
I've never seen anybody hit the deck running like she did. I mean, and uh, so we and you don't you don't talk about being in ministry without talking about your wife. We are in ministry because of that young girl and the Holy Spirit working through her and in her and in us to bring us to that point. They all know, and that's so. This is first year teaching at Coral Shores. That's Colleen. That's me. Um, this is uh, <laughs> What's with the hair? My guys are talk. I knew that. One. I put that up there because I've already had taken a couple of ribs on the hair. Uh, so this is right around the time that this spiritual journey was beginning, and uh, you know it was it was life changing. And and I. The verse in scripture that, that changed my life, quite honestly. What does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And I thought, what if I produce the best biologists, the best marine biologists, the best doctors in the world, and they die and go to hell? I can't stand that. And so I actually, at one time, had all the kids in my class in my marine biology. Somebody asked me about, could there, could there have been a world like blood? I said, well, let's see. And I went ahead and did all the evidence. And I had them put their heads down on their desk. And I gave an invitation. I was, I was, you know, at that point, I was too far into it not to. And almost every kid in the class raised their hand. Can you imagine doing that today? <laughs> I got in trouble then, but not bad. But I knew, I knew that God was doing something different in me. And that my days just as a teacher were, were numbered at that point. And so... That's how we ended up here. So now let's go back to this. This is a work party. <clears throat> remember, remember this man because I could never talk about him when he was alive. <clears throat> he was in his 80s one time and he brought me over here and he said, Tony, I got beat up one time when I was a teenager. And my daddy got me boxing lessons. And I never got beat again. And I want you to know if you ever mention my name in public again, I'm going to beat you to a pulp. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, Mr. Anderson. The building that we are in over there, the buses that we drove, the finishing of this high school building, all of that came from that man who walked in off the street and looked like, almost looked like a homeless guy. But he owned a major steel company in Indiana. And God used him over and over and over and over again just to set the course. And there's Humberto Jimenez again. And you got to understand, most of these guys in that picture are now in their 60s or in heaven. Who's the main looking guy with the yellow shirt on the far right? That, that's Humberto Jimenez. Oh, really? He was responsible for financing and all the finances, so that's probably why he has that look on his face. <laughs> And there they are again, same group, just, uh, I can name a lot of the people in there, I won't, but, so this is what it looked like in the service, in that building, a uh, lot of, a lot of uh, that old wood paneling, and that's Jim Lane, one of our elders, the first elders that we had, um, and Floyd Russell playing, playing the organ over there, it was definitely an organ, and the organ definitely had tubes, because he wouldn't play an organ that was electronic, because they don't sound right. <laughs> This is our Sunday school class, one of our Sunday school classes. We didn't have room inside, so we just taught Sunday school outside. Why not? And again, those would all be people in their 50s and 60s now. The old brown bus. When you hear me talk about the old brown bus and you see me get a smile on my face, this bus may mean as much as anything in this ministry to me because I volunteered to drive this bus before I even stopped arguing with Bruce about the claims of Christ. He was going on vacation. I volunteered to do it. Wayne was the bus captain. He would sit up on the back of those seats and play the guitar. And we were very concerned about making sure we only put 66 passengers on that bus, as you can tell. We would cram as many people on that bus and bring them to Sunday school. I would pick people up, honestly, on the way down here that were waiting for the, to, to go to another church. <laughs> and, and one time, one time, one of the pastors said, "You picked up my people." I said, "I didn't know you owned them." <laughs> and, and, and then, and then he, I said, "Hey, I know what we're going to teach. I don't know what you're going to teach." And uh, and so we, 
I just want to bring people to Jesus. And if they were standing out there and they'd hop on our bus, they were fair game. Exactly. And uh, years later, I had to go back and preach in that church, and I apologize to that pastor. For it. <laughs> but I'm not really. I mean, but this old brown bus is really a part of our history. This is the first bus we bought, and it was because of this man. Anybody recognize the name Tom Gurr? Does that name mean anything to anybody? It was one of the early treasure salvers. So there was there was Art McKee and Tom Gurr. Tom Gurr was in a legal battle for years with the government over some treasure he had found. And eventually, I'll just shorten this up, he was not going to win. So he took the barrels of all the treasure, says, you want it? Go get it. And dumped them all out. This was pre-GPS, so there's no GPS numbers or anything like that. Now, did he mark it on the charts? I bet he probably did. But, but so, Tom Gurr was a big part of our church, got saved. And these are Spanish coins from one of the galleons that he gave us. And that's what we used to buy the brown bus. Isn't that cool? Yes. I tell people all the time, how many people started their bus ministry with pieces of eight? <laughs> and there is the famous Cinemarana Theater. And that's what it looked like. It hasn't changed a whole lot from... Yeah, yeah you know. It, it, there's another wall coming out and the doors are different. There's a That open glass is not up there. Uh, back here you can't see it, but that's where the concession stand was, popcorn and all that. When you when we turned the lights on in that place, all the walls were painted purple. There was carpet that we didn't even know was carpet. We thought it was tile, but it was so it was so caked with grease and and sodas. And we turned the lights on, and the critters that were in there ran. I mean, it was like Whoa! the ceiling tile used to be like this, only it was all real crooked and everything and people would sit in the service and look up all the time wondering if they were going to survive if the ceiling was going to fall on them and occasionally a scorpion would come waltzing across so uh it's been a lot of fun over there <laughs> so here's island community church we would rent the theater out this is when we had the a group called the internationals uh and wayne and tina certainly would remember the internationals now we had that, we'd have big services. We would carry all the stuff we needed for the service from out over from that little building across the street every week for the service. And so finally, Mr. Henderson walked in and said, Brace, let's go by the theater. Brace had been praying about the movie theater and hadn't told anybody. I mean, I knew about it. A couple other people knew about it. His family knew about it. Wayne probably knew about it. But he said, let's go by the movie theater. I'm probably the one taking the picture, I would guess. But he walked in, knocked on Mr. Parmelee's door, which was right back over here, that little, you know where the, uh, the Welcome Center is now? That was Mr. Parmelee's office. In fact, that was a church and school office for a lot of years, for a couple of years. So he knocked on Parmelee's door and uh, said, Parmelee. I'm here to buy the theater. Now, obviously, they had conversation. I've never seen anybody do this in my life. He reached in his pocket, pulled out a wad of money. $200,000. Mr. Pomerley said, sold. And that's the last movie, honest truth. I used to change the marquee as a kid. The last movie to be shown at Cinemata Theater was The Godfather. Because I knew how to change the marquee, I jumped up. As soon as we closed the deal on it, I changed the marquee that said, God the Father. <laughs> and that was, that was just such a cool thing to have happen that way. Only God could, could orchestrate that. And that's Mr. Pomerley, by the way. And those of you that know news and media down here, you've heard all the talk about the Pomerley property down in Lorman Company. That's Mr. Pomerley right there, who is long gone now. So that's what it looked like in the auditorium, Island Community Church, back in the day. That was a big curtain that would pull, and the movie screen was behind that. When we got ready to, to tear the movie screen out, we went to it and started to touch it, and it disintegrated. It just turned to powder. Big pile. And uh, 
We, we have lights. You can see those are just lamps on the side, and that, that's a temporary sound system. And you see how the walls are all purple. That's why everything looks that way. Those seats look familiar? Yeah. Same seats. They are retro. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is, uh, Tina, help me out. Is that the Continentals? Probably. That's not eternity. Yeah, I would think that's the Continentals. What was the group you sang in? International. So you sang with the internationals, didn't you? Now, that connects Tina and I. I asked that on purpose. I knew Tina when she was coming out of college. She was Tina Birdie. Taught second grade for us. Was one of the first teachers I hired at, out of Florida Bible. And uh, started in 1974. Teaching here when we, the first year we opened the school. Uh, so it's getting a little bigger, a little more open. Uh, not sure who that is talking. It's not clear. By the way, these are all taken from 35 millimeter slides uh, in converted. So that's and so the, the quality of some of these is pretty sketchy. There is uh, who was that group? Remember Wayne? Maybe yeah. One of the groups from Florida Bible. What I wanted to see in this picture. Look at all the people and look at all the kids. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. Here we celebrated everything. Uh, I mean, literally celebrated everything. And this is one of our birthdays. Bruce, Bruce had a deal for doing anything bigger and better. Uh, we had a hot air balloon. Invited kids out from all over the community. People would come. We'd have, we'd have, we're, we're going to have the biggest snow cone. We're going to have the biggest apple pie. We're going to have the, you know, and it was all about getting kids here. People would call and complain about, you know, all you care about is, is the numbers and the size and the da, 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 da. And, you know Bruce's response is always well actually we do because people are coming to Christ you know and so that was a, a big part of it <coughs> there's the, the thing with eternity one of the groups I don't know if Tina's in there or not you're gonna have to yeah. look closely at that photo to see look at all the kids look at that. and that's uh, <coughs> th there's a reason that we were so kid heavy <coughs> You know what it was? The bus ministry. Back then, you could go around. I tell people all the time, I would have been, I would be thrown in jail today. I would go on a ten-speed bike in a pair of. Remember how the, in the seventies, the green gym shorts, green gym shorts, t-shirt or no shirt, and and white red stripe tube socks, and go knock on people's door, inviting their kids to come to Sunday school, and they would agree to let them come. <laughs> guy would knock on my door today looking like that I'd go 911 <laughs> Bill Andrews was deaf my wife actually learned sign language because when his wife would sign for Bill in church he thought that she was making up stuff to her advantage and wouldn't believe and, and wouldn't believe her he'd go <laughs> and so Colleen learned sign language and he trusted Colleen. When I was in grad school, I went to Tennessee Temple and to, to get my master's degree in education and they made me go through seminary. And the wives got to do things like that and she learned how to do sign language. But I remember when they were telling me I needed to go to seminary, I'd go, oh dear God, what does it have to do with learning a school? Yeah. And I'm sure God said, you'll see, you'll see. <clears throat> so no, anyway, Bill was, Bill, Bill was deaf. So he was the perfect guy to be Big Bird. Right. Just perfect, because he never talked. The kids couldn't, couldn't razz him, couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And just perfect for the role. And he was just one of the neatest guys. Gary Sheehan was one of our elders and uh, really had a heart for marathon ministry. And so uh, he was down there. We had a campus down there for a long time and, and several places. But Gary was, was uh, one of our early elders. Awana was a big part of what we did, um, these kids are now all probably in their 30s or 40s. But Awana Clubs was part of who we were for a long, long time. And honestly, it just, we just ran out of workers. That's, you know, honestly why we, we couldn't do it anymore. Uh, Richard Oates was a school administrator, uh, was here with us for all decades and decades and decades, and good man. 
And there's the uh, the reason I told you about the all the buses. We had bus captains, and we would pack those buses out and just bring them in every week, just to try and get as many kids as we could. And that's why we were so kid heavy. But because we were kid heavy, Bruce said, "I mean, I had only been around a little while." And Bruce said, uh, "Hey, Tony, you want to start a Christian school?" I said, "No, I'm a biology teacher, baseball coach. No." And he said, well, what if we fly to Pensacola and, and let's see what the Lord is doing. So we held a meeting to see if anybody was interested in Christian education. <clears throat> One lady showed up, Mrs. Walters. Still remember the lady. Bruce and I looked at each other and Bruce said, must mean we're supposed to have a Christian school. Somebody showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so... We flew to Pensacola. I don't have time to tell you the story behind all of that. Um, but we flew there, and uh, Elena, that's Miss Elena again, the, the consummate educator, she ended up not being able to come just because she had so much tenure invested in, in public education. I was just starting out. I, I didn't care. No, and God completely orchestrated the way this worked. I mean, there was no doubt about it. I. I, again, don't have time to tell you all the stories. That's a terrible picture, but that's the beginning of the elementary back behind the school building that when we started, we had basically from about um, March, maybe the end of February, till the beginning of the next year to build that entire elementary building. We worked nonstop. <coughs> this is our first youth pastor. He actually fell face first in the concrete when we were born slab. So that is not a staged event. That is just a mess. And, uh, uh, he survived about three more days after that. <laughs> but we would work until we couldn't go anymore. We would literally just fall over and sleep. Uh, we were looking for a guy that would drive in an electric company in Miami. Uh, went to um, a Baptist church in Miami. He was an electrician, had an electric company there, would work all day, come down here and work, and then go back up and work again. And we were eating one night, and we lost track of where he was. And so we followed the air hose through his nail gun. We found him sound asleep, curled up on the, on the, in the hoses back in the, where the nursery is now at church. Sound asleep. You know, and it was just, it, we, we worked and worked and worked. We were, we were the construction crew. And well, come on. That one didn't want to stay. Now we're back if we're going the wrong way. There we go. Okay, so I I assume one of our guys didn't make it. Those I'm not sure what the <laughs> That's Carl Pierce. Carl Carl Pierce is a man that I love. I can't even describe the love I have for Carl. Carl was at Florida Bible College. I played football with him in high school. And I'll tell you what made me want to hire Carl. Carl was not fast. In fact, he was one of the slowest guys on planet Earth. And, uh, but he'd go out and he'd run his laps. We'd all be, sometimes we'd laugh him twice. <laughs> he'd never quit. He'd never quit. Carl never quit anything in his life. And uh, he was just an amazing guy. I have no idea uh, why that's happening there. Um, <laughs> so there you can you can see the building going up in the back. That's that's not even. Think about this section on the side coming out this much further. That's how it went. And then uh, we got the school open. We opened with 54 students. Tuition back then was five hundred dollars a year. Thirty six, three hundred sixty dollars a year for preschool and kindergarten. Five hundred dollars, and you do the math and figure out how you pay teachers back then. We didn't. I I always tell the story on Tina. She had what you have six kids, and you got what thirty eight dollars. Eight dollars a student. So you got $38 a week was her salary, and she survived. You know, God God did all of this, or we would have been dead. We would have been dead. But 
<laughs> so by the end of that year, to show you what God was doing, but we had opened with 54. By the end of that year, we had 154. And by the beginning of the next year, 305. And we kept putting that number up there. It was so smart because as people begin to see that number, they go, oh, we, we got to get into this, which was kind of a cool thing to have happen. <coughs> so we had to start a junior senior high or a junior high. So we moved down the street. You go, where is that building? It's no longer exist. It belonged to Mr. Russell. I went to Mr. Russell. I said, Mr. Russell, I need you to give us that building. <coughs> and he was like, get out of here. And I remember Mrs. Russell sitting over playing with some little trinkets that they sold in there and just smiling. And pretty soon he called and said, yeah, you can, we're not doing much here anyway. So yeah, I'll move. So this is where we had, uh, there was a, one room that I taught in that if I got in the room last, I couldn't get in to teach because it was so tight. I had to actually um, get in the room first. <clears throat> so we jammed the kids in. If there had ever been a fire, we would have all been in trouble. And uh, so that's where we had uh, seventh through ninth grade. And I did that because I told a lady that owned the gas station. We had one senior that year. One senior that year, that's right, we did, who wanted to graduate from a Christian school. So we opened it and had one senior. So we. A lady at the gas station, which is up now where the main office is at, at uh, well, Holiday Island, whatever it's called now. Anyway, the, that was a gas station at the time. She wanted her kids to go to a Christian school. And I said, we can't do that. We're going one grade at a time. And she said, what if I get the kids? And I went, I tell you what, you get eight kids per grade and I'll do it. And I got my car and drove away thinking, well, I'll take care of that lady. <laughs> About three days later, She's got seventh, eighth, and ninth grade full, because that's about all we could hold. So I said, well, I guess we're going through ninth grade now. And that's how we ended up starting the high school. And then we just went on up from there. The next year we had two seniors, I believe, and one of those seniors came back to teach for us, actually. Um, that was the first year principaling. Who in their right mind would put a 26-year-old kid in charge of a school. I just think, I think about that now and it's just terrifying to me. And you didn't just, you didn't just teach, you also were part of the choir. This was, uh, everybody in there, I believe, was, was part of the faculty. And that's not the first year, that was one of the earlier years. So real quick on this one, um, I began to talk to Mr. Russell again. This, this property that we're on right now had been a ball field at one time. This was called Russell Field. And I began to pray, and I, I said, Lord, we need that property. We need to build our own high school, and, uh, and we need a place where, obviously, God is going to use. So I went to Mr. Russell, and Mr. Russell looked at me like I had been completely nuts. I said, I want you to give us the property. That's the way I start most conversations, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and Mr. Russell just smiled. But a few days later, he called back and said, I can't give you the property, but I'll sell it to you for 200 equal. What did we see? 235000 I think it was. And I'll give you all the interest that's allowed back. And so that's how we got this piece of property. And uh, that was seven and a half acres. So imagine a triangle from Park Road, US 1, and then I put noose running this way. That was, that was just God at work. That's the high school building. And John Beeler, the man that just talked about the one senior back there, John Beeler and I would climb up in that building from time to time because, and I'm sure some of the rest of you that were here, we climb up in there because that building sat like that for way too long. And we'd pray, dear God, Without you, we're doomed here. People in the community are mocking us because we can't finish this building. God, your reputation is on the line. <laughs> so many times in ministry, I'd go, God, I really made a mess. What are you going to do to get us out of it? And this, this was one of them. And that's when Mr. Henderson, he took me down underneath that area. That's when he told me he was going to beat the tar out of me if I ever mentioned his name again. But then he finished funding that building so we could get it finished. And so then um, we had all this, but some guy wanted to try to get in behind us and do some construction. Well, this is all mangrove. If you take Park Road, this is Park Road running right along like this. Take it all the way out to the Florida Bay and go all the way around here. 
this is where our property would have ended. So we had everything blocked. Nobody could get in there. And the guy said, I want to buy this. I want to put a road back there. I want, I'll, I'll pay you for it. And I want to develop that. And we said, sorry, it's all mangrove. He said, no, it isn't. He flew down, ended up having a nervous breakdown, realized he just bought the proverbial swampland. And so he wanted to sell it to us for a couple of billion dollars. So I got a great idea. Why don't you give it to us? We'll give you a great tax write-off. So that went on for years. Finally, I got a call from a guy in Barnett Bank up in Tallahassee who said, I'm, I'm handling environmentally sensitive property, make an offer. So I said, well, let me talk to some people. I went to a guy in the church and he said, well, offer him $20,000. I said, I don't want to insult him. He said, Tony, you've been asking for it for free. <laughs> I said, yeah, you're right. And so, so I called the guy back and he said, I can't do it for that. But if you can make it 25,000, I can do it. So 150 acres of surrounding property. And we gained a bunch of upland property where all those uh, pieces of equipment are parked out there. That was all upland that we gained from from that. So we now have more than seven and a half usable acres. Uh, this is where one of the buildings in Marathon, that if that looks like the Methodist Church down there, it's because it is. We, we lease from anybody and everybody. Um, so in 1989, I graduated, got my degree at Tennessee Temple, my master's degree. And as I said, I went through the seminary. First Sunday in January, 1989, uh, Bruce basically took a church in Salem, Oregon, tossed me the keys, said, here you go. And then, so I, I was interim. And then the church called me uh, after about, I don't know what, six months or something like that. Were you got a kid in Denise? Were you guys here about? Yeah, you were here then. So that was about about that time, about that time frame. So um, that's how I ended up being the, the the second pastor of Island Community. This is us burning the mortgage to this property when we paid it off. That we were absolutely debt free at that point, and uh, there are a lot of familiar faces back in there. Uh, kid in Denise, you see John Rady back there, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and then of course we didn't know what to do since we were out of debt, so we signed the paperwork to start a bond program to, to uh, build this building that we're in right now. And so we we started a capital campaign, and this is all tilt wall, so you're sitting in this place right now. What year did this start being built? Yeah. About eight, nine years ago. Is that about right? Well, 10 years ago. Was it like maybe 2008? Yeah, I can't remember. I, and you know, so many of these things are just kind of all blended together. Yeah. By the way, the Russell, I started telling you about the Russell property, the mangroves. What I would do, I couldn't, I couldn't walk out there. So I walk around. <laughs> I'd learned this from another old preacher. I would throw rocks. I'm an old baseball player, so I knew I could chuck rocks pretty good. So I'd throw rocks out in the woods. And I'd say, God, claim that for you. And just walk around. I, I, you couldn't walk out there. Back then, the crocodiles wouldn't have gotten you, but you just couldn't walk out there. Today, the crocs might get you. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what this building looks like. And uh, some of us have done a lot of life together. And uh, <laughs> I remember Wayne when he was just in college still, and Tina just coming out of college and starting to work for us as Tina Verdi at the time. And then there's a younger John Beeler. John, you had a little more That's hair. John Beeler. That's John Beeler. <laughs> yeah. That's a young well, John, and actually looks like his son now. Yeah. And Roy and Sue Bogue. Mm. Mike Young. This we used to lead kids on the Appalachian Trail. This is a very young Mike Young. Uh, he had only been away from playing college football for a little while in there. We are we were trying to cook garbanzo beans that I took along, and we didn't realize that at elevation, but garbanzo beans never cook. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up having a massive marble fight with garbanzo beans. That night. <laughs> Ralph Pratt and I had a lot of history together. This is back in the Promise Keepers days, and uh, Ken would remember those, Wayne would remember those, and John would remember those, but Ralph and I were always being put together. Ralph Pratt, now pastors, church in Key Largo, Hibiscus Park. Ralph was, was uh, one of our bus kids. 
We had a girl named Kathy Stamatinos, who was this tall, lanky Greek teacher. And she walked into Hibiscus Park, that's the African American community in Key Largo, one day and grabbed a basketball from a bunch of guys playing basketball. I said, Give me that basketball a minute. And Ralph walked over and said, Woman, are you crazy? Do you want to lose your life? What's wrong with you? And she said, well, I just need the basketball a minute. You guys all need to be in church. <laughs> and so they listened to her. They let her give the gospel. But by the way, if the people from Florida Bible College, just so you know, if it moved, it was going to hear the gospel. <laughs> if it had breath, it was going to hear the gospel. They witnessed to anybody and everybody every time, all the time. And so... Ralph was a kid then, and a, a mean, a mean kid. He really was. And uh, um, but Kathy invited him to Sunday school. And she said, "Get out of here! Leave me alone!" And uh, so Kathy, every week, would go knock on the door and walk around and knock on his bedroom window. Ralph, come on! You need to go to Sunday school. And she was a bus captain. And finally, he started coming to, to Sunday school. And he got saved, went to Florida Bible College, and now is a pastor in Key Largo. So, a lot of history. Just, I love, I love it when I see God take somebody's life and turn it around, and you see them come to Christ and then see what it does to the rest of their life. Yeah. And I've had the privilege, this is a, a young gal, uh, Marlon Moss's daughter, Skylar. This is her in, I think, kindergarten. And that's her graduating. So I've I've had the opportunity as long I love several of you have had the opportunity to watch a lot of your kids grow up and then become adults and I love the fact that of course you guys know who this is. One of our big events. Tim Tebow, Danny Werfel. I hated the fact that I had to be on stage with guys from the University of Florida. But <laughs> I I bit the bullet. We were doing an interview. This was this was a huge event. We had kids from um, all over South Florida that came into this thing. And, and uh, we had uh, Tim Tebow, Danny Warfel, and then, uh, well, King that's the country. other part of the interview. King country. King for King and Country? Yeah. I didn't even know who for King and Country was then. But with King and, for King and Country and Britt Nicole. I don't have a picture of Britt. I do have one, but I didn't put it in here. What year was that, Tony? 2013. Uh, 2013. 13. Yeah. 2013? Because it came from back there. Okay. So, we're getting near the answer, by the way. So, this is Ms. Gwen McFatteridge. Yes. And, and this is five year old kindergarten. She was my roommate. Was she really? Yes. So, so Gwen had this group of kids, and that's my oldest son right now, who is a patent attorney and is 47. Is that right, Colleen? 40, yeah. So, Turn around, how old would he be? Was that right? Yeah. That's what I thought. So this little kid that looks like Isla <laughs> is Mr. Pastor <laughs> Trevor Mann. <laughs> <laughs> Is that awesome? Now I can think about what that's what that does to my heart as a guy who was his school principal, and to watch him grow and grow and grow. And so, there I, was, I decided I'm isolated for you. See, doesn't that look like Isla? And there we are, sort of handing off the baton. I had hit seventy. And it was time to hand the reins over. I just felt that God had been leading that in the succession plan. And, and uh, <clears throat> so there we are. So excited to see what God has done. And uh, there's all three of the pastors. Uh, Bruce had come down and, and we had a doing some celebration and, and having to grab that picture of the three of us. And I left Trevor a couple of presents. Uh, Hurricane Irma. He took over not too long after that. That was that was the beginning of the end, by the way, for Island Christian School because families had no discretionary income. Families were bailing out of here like like nobody's business. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't. I tell people all the time, I don't think there'll ever be another quote private Christian school like Island Christian was in the in the Keys again because there's not enough margin of of income. Unless you can find teachers that'll work for thirty-six dollars a week, uh, you know it's just not going to happen. So, 
But then, I, so that's right after Irma. Uh, and then the other president I left him was COVID. <laughs> having, having to try to figure out how to pastor a church. No more. Okay. This, this, believe it or not, this is the first Sunday back um, at Island Community Church with COVID. So, and he's done a great job and continuing to do a great job. I couldn't be more thrilled, not that that matters two bits, because what really matters is what God thinks. And uh, I just, I love the fact that uh, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. You know, we're growing like crazy and and uh, you just see, you see God at work. I look out at the people and I go, Man, I don't know. 90% of the people here now, which is awesome. And one of the things we talked about, you know, studies show that the, they say the average age of a congregation is about 20 years on either side of the, the age of your pastor. So I thought, oh, how awesome is that? I can be pastoring a church of 50 to 90 year olds. <laughs> no offense. But if we're gonna pass the baton on to the next generation, we better be reaching the next generation. So. That was part of my goal in doing doing that. As I hope it was part of God's goal. I think it was. I think God is blessed and is continuing to bless. And uh, I love being able to partner alongside with Trevor. And uh, you guys know all of these guys. The guy, little guy hugging me is my grandson. It was such an honor to be able to baptize, do the whole, do all of the family here. So it's cool. And then I still love to be able to do the sunrise service, which is coming up, by the way, in April. And uh, I look forward to that. And of course, God has led me on in IAX to, to do all the stuff that we're doing internationally. That's one of the times I was speaking in, in Uganda, um, in Lugazi, in Uganda. And the guy in the suit, it's the first guy that I knew that died from, from COVID. He contracted it and they didn't have any, any means really to take care of him and he passed away. And he's the most, one of the most knowledgeable educators in the nation of Uganda, so it was a real hit to, to have him gone. But uh, look at all those kids. And so, as Psalm 145, 1 and 2 says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. You've seen a bunch of standing stones. You know, I talk about standing stones when I preach a lot of times. And then remember, during, as the Israelites were moving along, God would always tell them, build this standing stone, put up this standing stone, put up this standing stone. Why do you do that? So when your kids ask about what God has done, you can point back to it. And see, all of this doesn't matter. If all we did was show you buildings and concrete and material, it means nothing. What matters is the lives that you've seen change throughout this history. And the people that are following Christ and are sharing Christ with others throughout this world is what really matters. And and God has given us the opportunity now and the privilege to carry that baton on into the next generation. So that's it. That's the history, Good folks. Songs, by the way, I was a bus kid. <clears throat> oh, I tried to find a picture. I've asked Nikki if she's got a if she's got a picture. And uh, And that's how I came to know the Lord. So hopefully back on the sitting on the stairs, right? Yeah. Going upstairs. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think I look around this room, you know, and I, I, several times I've had to push back tears because I think about what God has done in so many of your lives. And it just makes me, uh, Mark, first time I met Mark, you, were you out of high school yet? In college. He was in college, came here with a group on a bicycle, on a wrestling tour. They stayed in our building. And then years later, he came back to work here as a law enforcement officer. And so I've watched God at work in Mark's life and in multiple chapters of his life. You know, just, I mean, and I can just go around the room. And, and I, John Mueller, one of my first teachers coming out of public ed, what, attended here, what, a year, John? Uh, eight months. Eight months. And an evangelist named Dr. Curtis Hudson, who was the president of Baptist University of America and, and uh, had a big Baptist church in Atlanta, Georgia preached here and did an invitation and called him forward and John received Christ in that church service. 
And as they say, all the rest is history. Yeah. And, and John Robin. Long, well, John, no, I'm not talking about John Long, because I'm still <laughs> mad at him. <laughs> I worked my tail off going to Hopkins Anderson College, Hammond, Indiana, and hired this lady. And he came from New York and stole her. <laughs> but I came back. Hey, but she came back, yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. But, wow. But, wow. So John and Robin have been, how long have you been part of Island Community? 80, 1980. 1980. 1980. I was 78. I was, I was led to the Lord by Bruce, yeah. Bruce led you to the Lord, wow. So, and John is now one of our elders, as is John Beal. So it's just so cool. And Robin is still keeping him straight. <laughs> yeah. So, so. <laughs> Any questions, guys? I know we're out, we're actually out of time. We should be out playing whatever we're going to play or move on. But anybody have anything? That was great. Thank you. We got it. All right. <laughs> Hey, let me just lead us in a word of prayer before we walk out of here and okay. because we need to thank God for all this. Father, we thank you so much for not, not the pictures and slides, but for just the fact that you have been a great God and you will continue to be a great God. Father, we, we continue to trust you as we move forward. We look forward to what you're going to be doing with this place and the people that will come to Christ because of this facility and the thought, fact that you've been able to allow us to to be here in this place at this time. Just thank you, Father, for loving like you do and for loving this place, loving these keys as you do. We pray your blessing over it now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, everybody.